Hey everybody, this is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. Recently, I picked up a postcard of William Howard Taft. And if you guys have uh, stuck around my channel for any great length of time or read any of my content on my website, you know that I'm a, pardon the pun, a really big fan of William Howard Taft. And uh, today I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, specifically uh, his connection to baseball. Now, he does have uh, a lot of legal connections and uh, a lot of connections with the T206, T205, T207, uh, and some other things uh, going on too. I'm not really going to discuss those in this video. That'll be actually a separate video, but today I'm just going to focus solely on his baseball connection his brother Charles Phelps Taft's uh, baseball connection as well. I, I couldn't find anything uh, card-wise of his brother Charles, uh, and William Howard Taft here does have a few cards from the era, but I really haven't been able to track anything down uh, for my collection. Uh, this I thought was really interesting, and I picked it up for 10 bucks. so like, how can you go wrong, right? especially for me being a, a, a really big fan of uh, William Howard Taft and his connection to the hobby and, and to the law and uh, taxation and, and all this other stuff. But I'll show you the back of this card. It's kind of interesting. And uh, it, it looks like this. I don't know if you guys can see this uh, really well, but on the back of it, it uh, says Washington DC, uh, March 6th, 1909. That's the post, uh, that's the, the postmark on this. And, uh, usually the handwriting on, on these things are, are pretty neat, but in this case, I can't really read the handwriting here. Someone's got like really sloppy handwriting. So and that's out anyway. Uh, so William Howard Taft, um, before I get into his, uh, his baseball connections here, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about um, his time in office. Uh, he was born on September 15th, 1857, and he passed away on March 8th, 1930. He's the 27th president uh, of the United States from March 4th, 1909 to March 4th, 1913. And what's interesting about this is that the postmark as uh, March 6, which is two days after he was sworn in as president of the United States. And uh, he also is the only president that we've had who is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And uh, he held that position from 1921 to 1930, took over for James White, uh, who oversaw the American Tobacco Company case in 1911. And so uh, he also has more uh, wins on the monopoly side than his predecessor, Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, both Roosevelt and uh, William Howard Taft were really good friends at one point. And then they had a, a huge falling out. And I'm going to discuss more about that in a, another a future video uh, that discusses everything else. Uh, but, you know, again, today... I just want to focus in on the baseball connections of both of these brothers. And uh, William Howard Taft, unfortunately, I think a lot of people really only know him for two things. Uh, one, getting stuck in a bathtub. Unfortunately, he weighed about 300 pounds when he was a president. So he, he's also known for throwing out the, uh, the ceremonial first pitch on opening day as well. Uh, in this case, to Walter Johnson. And uh, that baseball was actually signed by William Howard Taft. And I believe there are five other baseballs uh, op by uh, presidents uh, on opening day. Uh, and they were all given to Walter Johnson. They're all signed. And I think there are four of the five that uh, we know of today. Uh, unfortunately, what happened in that case was that they were stolen from the uh, Hall of Fame they were given to the Hall of Fame in 19, I believe, 36 or so, uh, or maybe 1945. But at one point in 1972, they uh, were stolen. And the Hall of Fame didn't realize this until 1977, uh, when a, um, a member of Walter Johnson's family 
our two couple members uh, showed up to the Hall of Fame, and they're like, "Where's the baseballs?" And the Hall of Fame had no idea where they were, and so they finally found uh, four of the five in a Ron Osser auction in the late '90s. Uh, Hank Thompson, uh, who is Walter Johnson's grandson, uh, was the one who actually found them uh, in an auction catalog, and um, Warren G. Harding autographed baseball. Uh, it's still missing. They have no idea where it is. But uh, the person who uh, who stole them from the uh, Cooperstown, uh, he he had a unfortunately had a he had a pretty bad drug habit and sold stole the balls to to pay for that drug habit. So unfortunately, Warren G. Harding autographed uh, baseball is we don't know where it is, and that's too bad. But uh, today. What I thought I would do is kind of break this down. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, William Howard Taft's uh, connection to baseball. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about Charles' connection to baseball. And both brothers have a really deep love for the game. And William Howard Taft, he um, he's probably the first president that we've had who was a regular at a baseball game. He used to go all the time, and he he studied the game uh, as if he were studying the law. He he really loved it, uh, and as far as his presidency goes, um, he probably didn't want to be president, and most likely he he was kind of coaxed into it by maybe uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And so, uh, you know, Roosevelt um, he doesn't really have any any baseball connections that I'm aware of. But he, he does uh, have a, a football connection there where he saved football, the, um, the future NFL, uh, from extinction in 1905. And I'll, I'll probably get to that in a later date. As I said, both of these guys were tight as ticks, right? So they, um, they had a really good friendship at one point, but politics got in the way. Uh, and, and so that kind of dissolved that. And what's kind of interesting, too, is that... Um, William Howard Taft is a stickler for the rules, the laws. Uh, he's he's a straight arrow by the book kind of guy. Where Teddy Roosevelt, not so much, uh, especially when it comes to monopolies. And it's it's kind of interesting because uh, Roosevelt uh, he he knew that there were a lot of monopolies that needed to be broken up, but he was like. Well, there are good monopolies and there are bad monopolies. So we're only going to go with the bad monopolies and try to break them up under the Sherman Act. Um, so uh, William Howard Taft really didn't see it that way. And he, he thought all monopolies are bad. And, and there are other things, too, that really kind of dissolved this friendship, which is really too bad. Um, I, I would really have loved to have sat down and have a beer with William Howard Taft or a Coke or coffee or whatever and just... I would love to talk to him about his knowledge of the game because uh, his knowledge of baseball was really, um, it was deep. It really was. He followed baseball uh, quite a bit and he knew the players and, you know, we don't really have too many presidents like that. I think uh, George H.W. Bush, he played baseball in, in college at Yale and then his son, George uh, W. Bush, was I think a minority owner of the uh, Texas Rangers, um, but for the most part, I don't think we've really had too many presidents that um, were were deeply involved in the game. And so uh, I did find a really interesting article from 1918 about William Howard Taft's interest in the game and what baseball had in mind for him specifically. And you'll find this equally as fascinating as I did. So here we go. This is from the New York Herald, November 25th, 1918. Taft imitates that he will accept offer. Former president, however, will not direct affairs of leagues by Frederick G. Lieb. And I, I could probably talk more about Fred Lieb at some other point. Very interesting sports writer. Anyway, uh, William Howard Taft, former president of the United States, imitated yesterday that he might accept a position as arbitrator for the National and American Baseball Leagues. Last Saturday, he was asked by Presidents Harry and Hampstead 
and Harry Frazee of the New York National and Boston American League clubs, respectively, to become a sort of a one-man national commissioner of baseball. Well, Mr. Taft imitated yesterday that he might give the offer favorable consideration. He made it plain that he should not assume any other of the former duties of the National Commission. He plainly stipulated that he would take no part in the management of any of the baseball institutions. The former president's statement, which was still sent to the public ledger of Philadelphia, follows, quote, Mr. Hampstead and Mr. Frazee called me on Saturday to ask me if I would consider acting as an arbitrator between the National and American Baseball Leagues in matters involving the legal construction of contracts between the leagues and their application to transactions between them as they might arise. I said to them that I did not practice law and as an advocate in court, but that I had acted as arbitrator in several cases. I said that if they would write me a description of the kind of arbitration in which they wished me to act and the particular function they wished me to perform, I would consider it and advise them. I could not act except as a judge of law in fact, or in any way take part in management of their associations. It must be work of a strictly legal professional character. I said further that I wished to consult my brother Charles to be assured by him that he had parted with all interest in baseball properties so that I should become arbitrator. No question would arise as to my impartiality between parties contending before me. It shows that with proper consideration by the presidents of the National and American Leagues, Mr. Taft might accept the position as judge of baseball and give the sport the benefit of his prestige as well as his trained legal mind. For some time, it has become evident that many of the duties of the present National Commission were absolutely superfluous. While it is evident that the offer made by Presidents Frazee and Hampstead of the Red Sox and Giants, respectively, while it is evident that the offer made by Presidents Frazee and Hampstead of the Red Sox and Giants, respectively, was known to only a quadri of Eastern club owners and had no real authority, their action is being well received. With the cards all on the table, it is evident a quote-unquote bloodless revolution was intended to sweep August Herman, the present chairman of the National Commission, and Ben Johnson, president of the American League, out of power. If ex-president Taft will consent to act as a judge to settle disputes between the two leagues, the coup d'etat will have been successful, as it will remove all necessity for continuing Herman in office as chairman of the commission. President Johnson of the American League was in New York yesterday but refused to be interviewed. It was said at the Hotel Walcott that he had given orders not to be disturbed. As Johnson is facing a revolution in his own league, perhaps he was afraid to say anything fearing he might further antagonize his own re revolutionists. Acting President John Hadler of the National League said, Baseball must be congratulated for seeking to engage a man of the character and distinction of William Howard Taft. Charles H. Abbott, president of the Brooklyn Nationals, lost little time in endorsing the action of Presidents Hempstead and Frazee. Yesterday, he sent a telegram to Mr. Taft saying he and his associates on the Brooklyn Club earnestly hoped he would accept the office of National Commissioner of Baseball. Ebbets assured Mr. Taft of his unqualified support. Connie Mack in Philadelphia said, quote, I regret deeply that a former president of the country should be placed in an embarrassing position by Frazee of Boston, who was acting on his own initiative. He was not empowered to speak for the American League.
Frazee is a limelighter and gives the American League a black eye by his irresponsible and unjustifiable action in offering a position to a big man of the country. The only way the National Commission can be changed is at a meeting of the American League. If the members want Taft as a sole member of the commission, they will decide so at a meeting. The National League may have to come to an understanding about Taft, but it kept it a secret from the American League, with the exception of Frazee, who is the last man in the world we would select to speak for us. This is from the same newspaper, it's just from a different section. Highlights and Shadows in All Spheres of Sports by Daniel. And that's really what it says, by Daniel. And my guess is that it's Daniel M. Daniel, a very famous sports writer at the time. Unless he is willing to give certain assurances and accept the position in the spirit and mental attitude in which he would take the presidency of a college or a railroad system, unless he is ready to meet exacting demands on his time, unless those who seek his services are ready to make the financial return commiserate with such demands, the good and bad features about the appeal to William Howard Taft to become the dictator in organized baseball balance themselves slightly against the proposition. There is no doubt that Mr. Taft would lend to professional baseball a poise and dignity in which it has been lacking woefully. There is no question that the game needs one big, strong figure who will command at once both the respect and obedience of leagues and fractions within leagues and would dominate in the decisions of organized baseball. It is true that by reason of his genuine interest in the game, his legal training, and his position as former president of this country, Mr. Taft is admirably fitted for selection as a one-man national commission. Perhaps he is better fitted than any other man who might be mentioned. Apart from the effect of his domination in the business of baseball in this country, Mr. Taft would exercise a most salutary influence in the spread of the game. Baseball has reached out to other countries, in some of which it is regarded as a war-born novelty, too frivolous for the a people of peace. The very fact that a man who once held the highest position uh, within the gift of the American nation thought well enough of baseball to become its court of last resort would have an considerable effect on these sport-loving peoples outside of our borders. Taken in all, it becomes apparent that the idea of having a one-man national commission with a figure such as Mr. Taft holding the position is an admirable one, and if uh, worked out well, could have only a beneficial effect on the game. The manner of offering the position was ill-advised. However, there are drawbacks to the position, and these are developed by the manner in which Harry Hampstead and Harry Frazee approached Mr. Taft. From the tenor of the statement, we gather that they went to Mr. Taft in an attitude of near supplication. They practically hurled the position at him and begged him to take it, no matter which hurled the position, or no matter which way, but to take it all in all hazards and save the game. This was a big mistake. In the sentiment issued jointly by Messrs. Hampstead and Frazee last Saturday night, they said, Our reason for hoping that Mr. Taft will make a favorable decision is that it would require very little of his time and not interfere with any of his present activities. If we remember rightly, a similar phrase occurred in the appeal to John K. Tenor, then governor of Pennsylvania, to accept the presidency of the National League and left the senior organization out of the slow of despond. Governor Tenor, too, was assured that the job would take very little of his time in substance that he would be president and John Heidler would do all the work. We all know how the scheme worked out. The League could not 
or would not pay mr tenor enough to buy even half of his business hours the league found that it could not run itself mainly on gubernatorial dignity that there was a volume of work which belonged to the president and could be done well by no one else the position offered mr taft bigger than the league presidents the position as a one-man national commission would require quite the whole-hearted attention of any man no matter what his capacity for quick decisions and his executive efficiency the duties which mr taft is asked to take up would be far more exacting and important than those of a league president organized baseball should not approach him with a plea that it would take only with a little of his time that is a false premise which would lead to a lot of trouble baseball has become a big business millions are invested in franchises baseball parks rights to players and even goodwill the game wants a man who will put organized baseball on a real business like basis for the fan sink the business into the game far in the background it is apparent that the job is a big one no more one afternoon in the week proposition by all means let us have william howard taft in the place but let him come not merely to add dignity but to do a big service for american baseball william howard taft ultimately didn't become the commissioner of baseball but just the fact that they were looking into having a commissioner of baseball as early as 1918 is really interesting and uh well we know that the first commissioner of baseball was uh Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was a judge. Um, personally, I think that was a really big mistake, uh, having Kennesaw Mountain Landis as the first commissioner of baseball. There, there's a lot of things that you can say about uh, Landis as a judge, where uh, I think the majority of his uh, rulings, some of them were made in bad faith, and a lot of them were actually overturned, uh, particularly the ones during World War One and uh he, he's got some some questionable things going on at the same time uh where he's commissioner of baseball and he's a judge at the same time and in fact there were two uh senators who uh, looked into this and said well you're you're double dipping here and you can't be doing that and they almost threw um, Landis off the bench uh for for doing that for being a a, a judge at the same time as being a commissioner of baseball um landis to me he's an interesting guy he's uh, obviously in the hall of fame um but I, I probably wouldn't have picked landis as the first commissioner i i like the fact that they actually asked but taft really wanted to be the supreme court justice and he got his chance now the, the funny thing with, with this is that taft nominated uh, James White uh, to the Supreme Court as the Chief Justice, and at the time White was, I believe, 65 years old. He he kind of knew that White was an older gentleman, um, and that he had some health issues. And at the time of his signing, uh, Taft said, "I would really love to be in your place. Uh, nothing would be make me happier." So like you know, Taft is saying like, "I'd rather have your job than mine." Is basically what he's saying at the time and, and you know he got his wish because white had died in 1921 but uh you know again, again william howard taft really wanted to be the supreme court justice and not the president of the united states i think he really didn't like that job and he was really more a behind the scenes guy anyway uh, and you can look at what he did in the philippine conflict the philippine american war uh, which uh, played out between like what 1898 and 1903 uh, or 1902 so uh, that's a that's a pretty disgusting um part of american history uh anyway so you have william howard taft and then now you have his brother charles phelps taft and charles phelps taft uh he's um the older brother the half brother of, of william howard taft he was born in 1843 and he passed away in 1929. He's actually a, uh, a one-time representative 
Uh, and then he's really mostly known uh, for being a newspaper man and uh, out in uh, Cincinnati. But there's also something to uh, with him. And he, he has more of a, a baseball connection than his brother does. Although his brother really knows the, the sport, but he relies a lot on uh, Charles Taft. Uh, and Charles Taft is his, uh, his campaign um, manager. Uh, through throughout like 1909, um, but it's it's really interesting here that um, Charles Taft's baseball connections go from like 1905 through like I want to say like 1913, 1914 around there. But I'm going to read uh, a, a few articles on this. This is really interesting too. And, and the other thing too, I, I wanted to mention that I kind of forgot about this. Can you imagine? what would have happened if William Howard Taft actually was the commissioner of baseball, how that would play out maybe uh, in like 1919. I, I have no idea. I, he's a, he's a different, completely different person than uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who I think is very outlandish in a lot of his statements and, and what he does in a courtroom. Uh, completely different from William Howard Taft uh, in a courtroom, by the way, too. L Landis actually has a, um, a very interesting thing happen to him um, well prior to uh, him becoming a uh, commissioner. So uh, Landis, he, uh, he walks into his office one day and he sees a box uh, that it says Gimbel Brothers on it. And this is a, a fairly large box. And he starts to open the box. And, and like, it's kind of strange that uh, at the same time, a sports reporter walks by or a reporter walks by and he sees this box and he knows exactly what this box is. It's a bomb. And these kind of bombs uh, were detonating all over the United States at the time by anarchists. And the anarchists had a list of all these people that they wanted to off. And uh, Judge Landis was one of them because he was uh, going after anarchists at the time and, and deporting them uh, without due process, mostly. Um, so like Landis was in the crosshairs of, of anarchists uh, in like 1917, 1918, 1919. And so uh, just by happenstance, the reporter goes by and he sees this and, and um, they evacuate the building and Landis is across the street and he sees the bomb go off. Uh, nobody was hurt in this, but there was a few bombs that did manage to uh, to kill some people and, and, and maim and injure them. Um, but uh, that again, if, if Landis had actually opened this box, um, history would have uh, been different um, for baseball and, and maybe in other ways too. And it certainly would have been different if uh, William Howard Taft became the commissioner of baseball and, uh, you know, some weird circumstance that he actually, uh, you know, took that job. He probably wouldn't have, uh, most likely, uh, just because he he didn't he didn't probably want the job. But it, it, it's kind of neat that they asked him actually, and the fact that uh, they they were looking at somebody with Taft's legal mind uh, in that position, in a, a position that they didn't even create yet. Um, and they were thinking about it, which is really interesting to me. And it kind of goes to show that they knew that baseball needed some help, that they needed to change. So it's also kind of interesting, too, that William Howard Taft uh, went after more companies for monopolization than Teddy Roosevelt. But at the same time, there was a congressman by the name of Thomas Gallagher who had asked, if we're going after monopolies, how come we don't go after baseball as being a monopoly? And he brought it to the floor. and. They said, nope, we're not going to even touch that. We're not going to go after baseball as a monopoly. Although it was a monopoly, uh, they didn't want to uh, touch that because uh, back in 1907, the Millis Commission wrote a report saying that baseball was an, an American sport. It was a national pastime. So you, you really can't go after uh, baseball if it's a, a national pastime to bring everybody together and then say, that uh, it's it's a monopoly and it has to be broken up. Although, if you were going by the letter of the law, that's exactly what should have happened under the Sherman Act. 
and then maybe the Clayton Act in uh, 1914. But that's not what happened. Uh, instead, did Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, declare baseball was uh, basically tax exempt? Although I don't know how he came to that conclusion. Oliver Wendell Holmes was a great justice, uh, associate justice. He wasn't a baseball man, and um, maybe even if that case went before William Howard Taft, it probably would have, uh, you know, stayed the same. Now, baseball today is still not considered a monopoly, although it should be and it's tax exempt. Uh, football, for instance, uh, they were also deemed tax exempt in 1934, yet uh, their tax exempt status has since changed as has uh, tennis as well. Uh, so I, I don't believe that they're tax exempt anymore as of a couple of years ago. And that actually happened uh, to be a subject of conversation uh, because of uh, the, um, the commissioner of, of football Roger Goodell was being paid $144 million contract uh, tax exempt, and that just ticked off uh, way too many people. And so they decided, okay, uh, football, you're no longer tax exempt. Uh, I'm waiting for the day when they say baseball is no longer tax exempt. It, it shouldn't be. It's ridiculous at this point. All right, so let's get on to Charles Phelps Taft uh, and his connection to baseball, which I think you guys are really going to find very, very interesting, as I did. And here we go. This is from the Tacoma Daily Ledger, December 31st, 1909. Mrs. Charles P. Taft buys baseball park. Sister-in-law of the president becomes owner of the Philadelphia National League grounds. Mrs. Annie Stinson Taft, sister-in-law of President Taft and the wife of Charles P. Taft of Cincinnati, is the new owner of the Philadelphia National League baseball grounds. The deed and lease for the property were filed in the city hall late this afternoon and shows that Mrs. Taft and not her husband has a title to the grounds. The purchase price was not given out, but papers filed with the recorder of deeds show that the price was $250,000. Assuming that Mrs. Annie Stinson Taft, her husband Charles P. Taft, and Charles W. Murphy are interested in more than one club in the National Baseball League, it is announced that they will be expected to I at least a faction in the league to dispose of their holdings in either the Chicago or Philadelphia National League Baseball Club prior to the opening of the baseball season. In commenting upon the purchase by Mrs. Taft of the grounds of the Philadelphia Club, August Herman, president of the National Baseball Commission, said tonight, I knew several days ago that such a step was to be taken. There is at present no rule in the National League which prevents anyone from owning stock in two clubs. But I think if Taft and Murphy do not sell the Philadelphia club before the opening of the 1910 season, they will be asked to do so. I believe that Taft purchased the Philadelphia club as an investment and intends to lease the grounds to the parties to whom the club is sold. Neither Mr. Taft nor Mrs. Taft would be seen tonight, but the, but the opinion was expressed by baseball experts that no serious controversy would arise. This is from the Pittsburgh Post, February 23rd, 1914. Murphy Case Talk of Fans Baseball fans had plenty to talk about yesterday, and the subject of debate was the exit from National League Affairs of Charles Webb Murphy, who until Saturday evening was president of the Chicago Cubs. Mr. Murphy was officially kicked out of the circuit during a little conference that was held in Cincinnati, and all the credit for practically forcing him out of the game is being given to Governor John K. Tenner. Not many years ago, this same Mr. Murphy was a reporter on the Cincinnati newspaper the late John T. Brush, who owned the New York club in the National League, also known as the Giants, took a liking to him and gave him a position 
as press agent for the Giants. It was while he was working in the New York. It was while he was working in New York that Murphy was told the Chicago club was for sale. He hopped on the train and went into the Windy City, where he was given an option on the team from James Hart. Murphy then made a flying trip to Cincinnati and conferred with Charles P. Taft, with whom he had become well acquainted during his newspaper career. Mr. Taft agreed to furnish financial aid in the purchase of the ball club, and a deal was promptly closed, the consideration being 100500 which included a $5,000 bonus to Mr. Hart. Frank Chance was made manager of the team, succeeding Frank Seeley. They won three pennants hand-wringing and made handsome profits for all concerned after a lapse of a year. The Cubs cropped still another flag. Twice they landed the world's championship. Charles W. Murphy has caused more upheavals in the National League's meetings than any other man ever connected with the old baseball organization. For seven years, his fellow magnates have been trying to either buy him out or to force him to sell his holdings, but in all instances, he succeeded in defying them. At last, it remained for Governor Tenor, before he had been in his seat as president of the league two months, to oust Murphy single-handed. President Barney Dreyfus of the Pittsburgh Baseball Club returned home yesterday from Cincinnati, but announced that he could throw no more light upon the outcome of the meeting than had already been published. Not one of the club presidents attended the conference, which was held in Mr. Taft's office. Beside Mr. Taft and Governor Tenor, those present were John Conway Toole of New York, attorney for the National League, and Harry Acklin of Pittsburgh, who owned stock in the Chicago club. The club presidents who had been called together were Barney Dreyfus, Pittsburgh, James E. Gaffney, Boston Braves, Harry N. Hampstead, New York, Charles H. Ebbets, Brooklyn, August Herman, Cincinnati, William F. Baker, Philadelphia, and Schuyler P. Britton, St. Louis Cardinals. These, together with Secretary John A. Heidler of the National League and Ashley Lloyd of the New York Club, Edward McKeever of Brooklyn, Harry Stevens of Cincinnati, and L. O. Hawker of St. Louis, meet in the Hotel Stinson and await the outcome of the conference at Mr. Taft's office. Details of the conference were not made public, but it is known that after carefully discussing the angles of the situation, Mr. Taft was convinced that he would be doing something that would meet with the unanimous approval of the seven club owners by inducing Murphy to resign. That Murphy did not retire before a lot of persuasion was brought to bear is indicated by the rumor that the long-distance line that connected Mr. Taft's office with the Chicagoans' residence was in use for about a solid hour. At the end of this period, Mr. Tenor officially announced that Mr. Murphy had sold his holdings to Mr. Taft and had handed in his resignation. Who will head Cubs? Harry Ackerland's host of friends in Pittsburgh hail with joy the announcement that he will become the next president of the Chicago Nationals, and it is reported that he has received an offer of the position from Mr. Taft. Before he left for Cincinnati, he was asked if he would be the candidate in case Murphy should retire from the league, but he politely declined to talk. After the sale of Murphy's stock to Mr. Taft, had been officially made public at Cincinnati, the Pittsburgher again refused to discuss the question of who would succeed the retiring president. Ackerman did not return home yesterday, remaining with relatives in Cincinnati. Ackerman has imitated his intention of going out of the business in which he has been engaged in Pittsburgh and entering other fields, but whether or not he contemplates becoming a baseball club owner, he did not state. He has always been an ardent fan and has shown that he possesses ample knowledge of the inside details of the game. 
to qualify him as an ideal official. He is only a minority stockholder in the Chicago team, however, his holdings amounting to 10 shares, which he purchased from Frank Chance shortly after the latter retired from the management of the Cubs. Murphy held 51 shares of the remaining 39 were owned by Charles P. Taft. The directors of the Chicago club will meet within the next few days to reorganize and elect a successor to Murphy. During the present week, the National League's board will also convene at the call of President Tenor to fill the vacancy made by Murphy's withdrawal. Governor Tenor spoke at the Elks Banquet in Cincinnati on Saturday night. Messrs. Dreyfus, Abbott, and Herman also attended the big event. The governor passed through Pittsburgh late last night on his way to Harrisburg. While in Cincinnati, Colonel Dreyfus saw outfielder Mike Mitchell, who is anxiously awaiting the arrival of Sunday morning, March 8th, when he will board a train of pirates en route from Pittsburgh to the training camp at Dawson Springs, Kentucky. So this, so this is really interesting uh, because there's something very weird going on with uh, the purchase of the grounds itself, the Baker Bowl. Okay, so this is the Baker Bowl that uh, the grounds are being purchased from uh, a, a man by the name of Charles Murphy. And uh, Murphy actually is being, um, eventually in 1914, he's out of baseball. They, they push him out of baseball. And so um, in the meantime, uh, a lot of people in the press are saying that um, the, the new owner of the, of the Phillies, uh, which is a man named Horace Fogel. He's a sports reporter. He's a sports writer. And he really doesn't have like two nickels to rub together, right? So he doesn't have a whole lot of money. So he definitely needs a backer for uh, the $350,000 that's needed at the time to purchase the Philadelphia Phillies. That's the equivalent of over $10 million, almost $11 million at the time. So people are like, wait a minute, like Fogel doesn't have this money. Where is he getting the, the check from, right? So they put two and two together that it's actually uh, Charles Phelps Taft who uh, gave him the, the money to do this. So he's actually uh, the minority owner of the Phillies already. He buys the, uh, eventually buys the team uh, from Vogel uh, and uh, also, he has uh, another team, too, which is the Cubs. Uh, this is really interesting because, well, first off, Fogel is gone by 1912. He's banned from baseball permanently. And he's eventually going to be like the first of, of two Philadelphia Phillies owners that are banned from uh, baseball. The other being uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Cox. Uh, and so like uh, he's... He's banned in 1943 for uh, betting on his team. Uh, anyway, so uh, back in like the 1890s, there's uh, there's a rule that prohibits one owner from owning uh, multiple clubs, and that almost destroys the National League uh, in uh, like 1899, 1898. Because what was going on was that you'd have uh, owners of uh, – two clubs and they would be feeding uh, one club with uh, another club and then that other club would be like you know in, in the toilet basically and the other club uh, would have all the money so they said no you can't do that anymore and uh, it, I guess it's a I thought it was like a well-known law a baseball law if you will so they stopped doing that supposedly in uh, like 1899, and they reorganized the National League. And this actually is the very beginning of the American League as well. You have Charles Taft as the owner of, of the Reds. In 1908, I believe he sold the Reds to August Herman, uh, who became the majority owner of that team. And then he already has the, uh, the Cubs. And uh, he... He becomes the majority owner of the Cubs 
when Charles Murphy is booted from the game. He's not banned. He's just they just didn't want him there. He's a pain in the neck. Murphy ends up uh, selling out to Taft, Locke. And unfortunately, what happens to Locke is that he ends up as the majority owner of the Phillies, but he he dies uh, suddenly in 1913. And uh, Bill Baker, who is his cousin, uh, William Baker, he owns the Phillies now. And uh, it, it really kind of messes up the Phillies forever. Or well, not forever, but in like 60, 60 years, uh, the Phillies really don't do a whole lot. Uh, it's un unfortunate, too, because this is what happens when you have bad management run ball club or a company or um, government agency. It just, you know, comes down to really bad management. So at this point in time in the press, uh, when they're interviewing Taft, he's saying, no, I don't own the Phillies. I, I only own, you know, maybe part of the Cubs. And uh, the thing is, like, this was kept under wraps. Nobody was talking about uh, uh, Taft owning two ball clubs at, at the same time because it was, uh, it was taboo. It was it's something you shouldn't do. And, and it was maybe... Um, not legal, I guess, in, in the eyes of baseball to, to have this because you could destroy ball clubs. And that's, and again, that's exactly what happened in 1899 with the restructuring of the National League. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And the other thing, too, is so now now that uh, they said his wife, Charles's wife, uh, owned the um, the rights or the deed to uh, the Baker Bowl, the, the, the land itself. And uh, they bought that from John Rogers and A.J. Reach. And uh, Reach, you guys might know about, uh, he's the uh, the sports guide. Um, and he, uh, he's he got a really interesting story himself. He actually uh, was one of the guys who founded the Philadelphia Phillies uh, back in 1883. And the Phillies were actually... Uh, the uh, the Worcester Ruby Redlegs from Worcester, Massachusetts. Why you would put a, uh, a a professional baseball club in Worcester when you had Boston like right there doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It didn't back in like 1879, 1880 when they put the club there, uh, and it, it uh, only made sense if if Boston uh, were not as a big a population as it was uh, compared to Worcester, uh, but. Uh, the Ruby Redlegs ended up moving to Philadelphia and became the Philadelphia Phillies in like 18, God, I want to say 1883. So um, that I thought was interesting. And then uh, the Taft family themselves, they still owned uh, the deed to uh, the uh, to the stadium, uh, the Baker Bowl, uh, up until like 1938. So they were just renting out to the Phillies. But the Baker Bowl, from everything I've heard and read, uh, that was a pit. Uh, it was just in um, in such decay. The city of Philadelphia uh, ended up condemning the Baker Bowl in 1938. And uh, the uh, the Phillies actually had to uh, rent uh, room from Scheib Park. And they were supposed to uh, give... Connie Mack, like 10 cents per head uh, of the, the ticket sales to the uh, to the club, um, to the field, I should say. And uh, that never really panned out very well. So I, I think um, Connie Mack was being taken advantage of uh, at the time. And he really didn't have anything to fall back on either. I, I, unlike most other owners of the time, Connie Mack was only really supported by the ball club and a small pension, uh, whereas, say, Jacob Rupert had his uh, his beer, uh, and that's how he was making money. And all these other owners were making money uh, in other capacities other than baseball, just in case their clubs folded. The Phillies almost folded twice. I don't know how they managed not to. They're actually... Uh, bought at one point by the National League, and then they were uh, sold twice. So uh, that's another uh, story altogether, but very fascinating. Um, and, and so you can see uh, in uh, different directions where this is going, and, and a lot of it uh, happens to be because of Charles P. Taft 
and how he operates the clubs and buys them. And again, like he didn't want to tell anybody that he was the owner of any of these clubs outside of the Cincinnati Reds, which uh, apparently he was a minority owner going back to 1905 uh, through like 1908. He uh, was, the I think, the sole owner uh, in 1908. And it looks like from the newspaper accounts that he sold his shares of the club to uh, Jerry Herman. I'm not sure why Jerry Herman's not in the Hall of Fame either, by the way, or, uh, you know, John K. Tenner probably should get a, a couple of votes as well, um, just to just to see how that would play out, because he's really kind of an interesting guy. And then William K. Locke, who was uh, very briefly the owner of the Phillies, um, Unfortunately, like I said, he, he was supposed to be the president of the Phillies and he, he passed away um, a few months after he bought the team and uh, and his cousin uh, Baker, uh, William Baker, bought the, uh, bought out his shares uh, and he, he remained there until 1933 and just absolutely destroyed the Phillies. No good. You have a lot of, a lot of really bad owners of, of these clubs that just, they don't go anywhere. They're constant cellar dwellers but I, I thought this was really interesting on uh on both the taft brothers and their connection to baseball it would have been really interesting if william howard taft actually became the commissioner of baseball how that would affect the game or say like the 1919 world series how that would play out i have no idea we we just don't um william howard taft again really fascinating president uh really behind the scenes kind of guy. There's so much to him and his presidency uh, that I'm going to actually do another video on him specifically uh, in regards to how he thought of the law and uh, the T206. Uh, because if, if it wasn't for him, uh, we wouldn't have a, a 1909 T206 or a T205 or even T207. Uh, T207 is a little bit different though. And at the same time, we very rarely do we ever think of the legislative portions that make our uh, cards possible. And, and um, William Howard Taft is a, a, plays a big role in that. Uh, and so I'm going to discuss that in another video. And then uh, the 16th Amendment as well. And because uh, he's, he's a big part of the 16th Amendment uh, during his presidency uh, that w uh, was enacted by Woodrow Wilson who, uh, another interesting guy. I'm not a big fan of Woodrow Wilson for other reasons. William Howard Taft definitely plays a huge role in, in the hobby as, as we know it and the rarity of a lot of our tobacco cards. So guys, thank you so much for stopping by. I greatly appreciate it as always. Let me know what you think of William Howard Taft or uh, what I've talked about in these articles. Uh, and I'd love to, I would love to hear what you guys have to say about it. And until the next time, I will talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye.